React India. Hi everyone, are you enjoying React India? Are you enjoying the conference? Have you learned a lot? So this might be a little least technical topic that I'm going to talk about, but it's the most important one. And I'm going to talk about how empathy is relevant. It's a technical skill that you can build on and it's relevant for software industry and software developers. So a bit about myself, I'm Rifa Dias and I work as a TPM at Red Hat. So I've been in the tech industry for seven years. I've been into multiple roles. I started off as a software engineer and now I work as a TPM. So in this role, my main job is to make technical projects successful. And the key in making any project successful, what I see is empathy. So let's start. Uh, this is what we are going to discuss today. We are going to discuss what is technical empathy? How is it relevant to software development? The challenges faced by software professionals due to lack of technical empathy? Areas where we can apply technical empathy? And some tools to help you build on this technical empathy skill. So what is empathy and how is it a technical skill? So empathy, you define empathy as the ability to understand or, you know, feel what another person is going through and experiences from their frame of reference. It's a lot like being in somebody else's position, understanding their thought process or what is the person going through in that moment. It's a lot like being in somebody else's shoes. So you might, this might seem like a, you know, soft skill or something that you are inbuilt with or some, some feeling. But how is it a technical skill? So recently I came across this course. Do you know who this person is? Arsene Wenger? Anybody? Any football fans here? Arsenal fans? So he was a former Arsenal manager. Arsenal is a football club. And in his book, My Life Lessons in Red and White, he says, passing the ball is communicating with another person. It's being in service with another person. It's crucial. And for the pass to be a good one, the player has to put himself in a position of a person who's going to receive it. It's an act of intelligence and generosity, what I call technical empathy, end quote. So I think this is very relevant even for software developers. We'll see how it's relevant and we can apply it in software development. So we write code. Coding is a form of communication. We write code not only to impress the machine that we are writing it for, no matter how best code we write, we write code to solve user problems. We write code to develop software to solve user problems and that, are, that is for a human, we write it for a human. And for a software to be a good one, we should put ourselves in a position who's going to use our code or use our end software and uh, think from their perspective what problem we are solving. So empathizing with our users and thinking what it is like to use our code, thinking what it will be like to walk in their shoes. Why technical empathy? We said, why do we need to, you know, empathize with our end users? So we are going to go through some scenarios and uh, you can raise your hand if you ever been in this situation. So the first situation, your manager, your technical lead comes to you and says, He assigns you a task and say, it's a simple task. It will take just two hours. And you say, OK, you go to your desk. You start coding. You realize this task cannot be done in two hours. And this is how you look like. Have you ever been in this situation? I have been. So I can see most of you have been. So what happened in this situation is that your manager or your lead or whoever assigned you that task, he made an assumption based on his personal experience. Maybe he knew how to do the task in two hours. But he did not think from the perspective whom he assigned the task. Maybe he was had a less experience in working through on that particular task. Maybe he had other priority tasks that he was supposed to work on. And when you switch from one task to another, it takes time. So because of that, we made a wrong assumption. Second scenario. You're going through a code. And you're wondering how bad this code is. And you're wondering who wrote this code. And then you check on Git. 
and guess what you realize? It was you who wrote this code few months back. So empathy is not only for someone or empathizing for someone. Empathy can also work when you empathize with your future self. Think of a time in future. Think about the future, maybe in few months or few years. Who who is going to use your code? Maybe it will be you in your future. Maybe it will be some other developer writing a new new future, a new feature. Or maybe it will be your project manager. Or maybe it will be a developer solving or fixing a bug. So when you think of the situation, now you know what is required. Maybe pro proper commit messages. Maybe the, maybe the context why this code was written in a certain way. Why was this commit made? Or why was this particular decision made? Or why was this framework used? So when you think about this, and when we apply the concept of you know empathizing with your future self, I think we can fix this problem. Third situation. You are in a meeting with your business stakeholder. They don't look happy. They are pushing for a particular feature. They say it's a small feature. Why can't you, this be done? They are having an argument with the engineering team why this feature can be done. And the all the engineering team hears is some marketing buzzwords that they throw at you. And they don't really connect why this feature is important. Maybe it's an easier feature, but it's difficult with your current tech of st uh, technology stack that you have. So, and the marketing team says it's easy, but they don't understand your technology stack. So, we see it as a disconnect between two teams. Two teams are not able to understand. The engineering team is not able to understand the non-technical or the marketing team. And that's why we see <laughs> why we miss deadlines or why the project fails. So we have seen why technical empathy and empathy and in technical context, why this is important. So these are some of the areas where you can apply. Uh, empathy will not only be in the roles where customer facing role where you interact with the customer, but we have also seen that we require during the design and requirement gathering phase. That's the first thing when you are designing, you need to empathize. You need to know who your user is and empathize with them. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, second is throughout the coding process. You need to empathize with your future self by writing proper commit messages, the note, the context, and thinking who will use your code in the future, another developer or a person who is fixing your bugs, or you in the future. During software integrations, we have multiple cross-functional teams that we have worked with. We have front-end developers, we have back-end developers, we have people who work in the middle way, we have people who work with the database. And that's definitely a disconnect. We don't know what the other team is doing, or what the priorities are for the other teams. We only know what priorities we have. So when we have empathy for the other team and know why they are pushing for a particular feature, I think we can solve this particular problem. And the most important one is while taking on leadership responsibilities. As leaders, we should know what exactly our team needs to work on at the right time. We should know what motivates our team, why someone on our team is not able to perform, uh, what motivates them, and what other skill sets they are lacking or need to build on. So because of this, it's very important for us as leader, leaders, not only if we have a leader you know, managerial title, but also when we are in engineering roles and, you know, take on res uh, leadership responsibilities, it's important to have technical empathy. So when we talk about empathy and we see it as a skill, that's uh, when we see it as a technical skill and it becomes easier to, you know, use it as a skill. We only think of it as something that we are born with. So is there anyone in the crowd who was born with the skill of coding without learning, practicing? He knew how to code? Wow. <laughs> Great. Yeah, there is someone that can be special. But for most of us, we had to learn and practice. And that's how we learn and build the skill. And then for the same way, we have to you know, uh, think of technical empathy as a skill that we can learn and build on. So just like learning a new coding language, learning a new skill like playing a football, we need to learn and practice it every day. 
uh, these are some of the tools that I'm going to talk about. So we need what, what exactly we need to practice. And I'm going to talk about all these six things. So the first tool I'm going to talk about is creating communication artifacts. This is when you code. The notes that you leave behind, the commit messages, the documentation, maybe uh, coding best practice documentation, maybe your API documentation, maybe some other documentation or providing a context why you made a particular decision. It's crucial. And whenever you write a message, think of these four things before drafting a message. Who are you leaving the message for? Whether it's for you, another developer, somebody else, the context why you are leaving the message. Third one is, what is the message? What exactly needs to, and how it has to be fulfilled? And what will be the feasible currently in position you are with? So these four things will help you draft better messages. The second tool is identifying human biases and assumptions. So cognitive bias. We all fall into traps of biases. So being aware that you know these biases are there is how you overcome it or how you avoid biases. We can't blame people for their biases. We all we can do is have open conversations with context, ask questions, and that's how you know you avoid them. So developers, everyone can even introduce their personal beliefs, assumptions in software and coding practices can influence prioritization, design, even system architecture. So we see that there are several biases and they have been studied and you know documented, but these three are very common occurrences in software development. So I'm going to talk about these three ones. First one is optimistic bias. Anybody knows what is optimistic bias? Okay, optimistic bias as, it, uh, or cognitive bias, if I define cognitive bias, it's something that a person is, you know, thinks uh, uh, how a person understands facts and uh, events based on his personal beliefs. And they may not be accurate or reasonable. He only believes based on his, only understand based on his belief system. So optimistic bias is a tendency to be overly optimistic about estimations or judgment. Uh, we see this when, you know, very experienced people make estimations. Oh, this can be done in two hours. So that is called optimism bias. So when you see that kind of thing happening, maybe it's unconsciously or subconsciously say, consciously happening, but you need to question it. That's how you avoid it. Also, optimism bias, we can see that you have a preference for a particular framework or maybe a particular, particular coding language. Even if somebody, uh, you can push that bias to your team. You say, okay, this is the best framework without even, uh, you know, thinking, second guessing, or checking other things. So the next one is confirmation bias. Uh, confirmation bias is a uh, tendency to be, uh, it's a tendency when you uh, uh, produce undue attention to the sources that confirm some import, uh, sources that provide information that, you know, confirm your beliefs, uh, rather than something that you, uh, challenges your beliefs. Uh, we can see this when, you know, uh, especially when we write unit test codes. We tend to write uh, unit test codes um, with a set of data to test just the happy path. So that, you know, we know th this is how a software is going to work. We prove that this is how a software is going to work, rather than, you know, thinking of breaking the software, those corner cases. We write a unit test code, maybe not we, but there's a high tendency of this happening, of confirmation bias, when we write a, to test the happy path of uh, exactly proving how a software works. The third one is anchoring bias. Uh, the, uh, it's a tendency to be, you know, provide undue attention or uh, something to the first piece of information that you receive. Something that you receive from initial, someone tells you first and then you grab your attention only to that. If whatever comes next, you are still stuck with that. That is your anchor and your anchor to that particular information. <coughs> so when do you see anchoring bias? Uh, we might have some coding practices. We might have some uh, frameworks in our code base. 
no matter how outdated they are how messy they are how wrong they are we keep using them we keep running the same messy queries that are there and this is what leads to legacy code so we are anchored to those even if something is better just because we have you know that's the first piece of information that we receive we are we are anchored to that and that's how anchoring bias is introduced question do you think ai can be biased we uh, we let ai make decisions just to avoid human biases so do you think ai can make biased decisions let's see so what do you use to train your ai models where does that data come from so the underlying data set that you use from to train your ml models that that is comes to, uh, human chooses that and that can come from a restricted set or a you know limited data set and uh, we decide what the de uh, decisions that data is going to make a human decides so that's how uh, bias can be you know bias uh, we can build biases even in the ai so without extensive testing or having extensive data data representation from a vast diverse source it's it's impossible to have a unbiased ai so how do we create unbiased ai firstly being aware our data scientists needs to be aware that this biases you know get built into the ai training ai with diverse data sets constant testing and evaluation and uh, i think this can be done when we open source our algorithms that we have when more people know what exactly is going on how decisions are made i think more people can contribute to it and more testing and more feedback and that's how we can make unbiased data unbiased ais and building ethical frameworks some of your company ethics or frameworks that you believe should be there that you know should be compliant with your ai the third tool we are going to talk about is user centric approach so i think we have discussed this before so whatever tools we are designing whatever products that we are designing or whatever applications that we design we should know who we are designing it for identify the user and their needs what we are using adopt and embrace user centric designs and design thinking methodologies so what is user centric design so this is a iterative process user centric design it's a if any designers are uh, you might be aware of this thing uh, it's a iterative design process where you put user empathy at the center of it so it goes into stages but at each stage you keep going back to the user you specify you gather the information from the user what exactly is needed how the user is going to use this product and in what condition the user is going to use this product once you gather the information i think you generate insights specify uh, generate insights and see what what are the business requirements we all have business requirements but how do they translate to you know the user after the gather the insights uh, we create designs that is how you prototype and write you know create uh, start creating your application and then third one is gathering the feedback and evaluating what designs so in, even in this process uh, the users feedback is being taken so it's a whole cycle which which keeps repeating so uh, there's another uh, process which helps you know with user empathy and this is not just relevant to design but as also as developers or also as users end users of product we can implement this uh, this philosophy anyway so design thinking says there are there are five stages in the first stage and in this process is where you work collaboratively with your designers the designer the developers and everyone is on you know working together so first you empathize with your user you start knowing your user you gather the information you generate insight from the user you define what it is once you have the uh, insights what you gathered from the information you try to create ideas you try to ideate you try to uh, create scenarios or you know personas and once you do that you start 
coding or building your application, creating prototypes. And the third part is you do your user testing and gathering feedback. So even this is an iterative process. This two, uh, uh, this two processes that we talked about, user-centered design and design thinking, this can put the user in the center of it. So, um, so we talked about user-centered design and design thinking. Uh, the third one is business problems to human-centered problems. We all have business problems that we want to solve. Maybe optimization, uh, more users. But what does that mean to the user? How is it solving a human problem? We need to convert that to effectiveness, how effectively or how user-friendly your application is. And inclusivity is how diverse your application is. It's not just for one geography or for one culture. We should think about, you know, as large set of data as possible. And uh, these are some of the advantages that will help uh, improve quality, team productivity, and brand value. So the fourth tool is encourage everyone to be tech curious and encourage continuous learning. Why do we have to be tech curious? We have seen before that we work with various cross-functional teams. There are front-end teams, there are back-end teams, there are data scientists, and most of the time we have no idea what they are working on, what tools and technologies they are using. So because of that, because even when we build you know, system architecture, system design, we are unable to you know, do trade-offs or come on the same page or make decisions. So because of that, when you are aware and tech curious and know what all goes, we are able to you know, co collaborate better. Also, we have an understanding of how the whole process works. Uh, the second point is continuous learning. The more, the more you learn, the more knowledge you gain. And when you have more information, you'll see there are multiple solutions. And the solutions can be solved in multiple ways for the same problem. The fifth tool is think beyond your role. Breaking down silos. We build these silos for ourselves. I'm a developer. So my job is done once you know, I merge a, merge a PR or you know, commit the code. We throw problems over the fence to the QA team. Somebody from the QA, even if we are aware of it, we wait for the QA team to come and point to us. Or we wait for other teams to tell us. So the first point is breaking down silos and working together in a collaborative environment for us, you know, to make better software. Uh, learn from diverse experiences and perspectives. This will help us to uh, stop reinventing the wheel. Um, many a times we see that, you know, there are different teams working on similar th things that we are working on. Maybe they have already built a framework that we are trying to build from scratch. Rather than reinventing the wheel, we can simply utilize what is already built. So having diverse experiences and perspective will help us with that. Being mindful of team specific jargons so that you know, whenever a non-technical person comes, even he is welcome and he understands and empathizes with you. We have seen that in one of the scenarios where the business team was pushing for a particular feature because they don't understand what exactly is going on. Because you might be being too technical and not conveying your ideas to them or problems to them and uh, communicate more clearly. Creating a collaborative environment. I think this React India, this, uh, this platform itself is an example of a collaborative environment. How you promote a culture, how you build a community, where you have seen multiple, multiple people come and share their knowledge. You have learned so many new things. And because you share some common things with them, Maybe you have gained so much knowledge and you find, okay, there's somebody else out there similarly like me trying to learn. You, feel, uh, you have the sense of belonging when you work in a community and you are motivated. And that's how, you know, that's one of the tools that is used for building technical empathy. So I think I have covered all the points, organizing, team building. I think this conference itself is an example of that. So, yeah, that's it. And... Uh, with that, thank you, and I hope you are all going to build a skill of new skill of technical empathy now after being inspired with this talk. Thank you.